Um, so one of the tools, and there are four tools we're going to talk about today, but one of the tools that you have when figuring out what problem to solve and figuring out if you can solve the problem and if the problem's important is that of specifications. And specifications are usually generated by you, the engineer, or your engineering design team, or they're given to you as part of the problem. And specifications are very, very valuable, and they really come in two flavors, and we use specifications in two ways, and so it's very careful to distinguish what those are. Um, first of all, specifications can outline very precisely um, at a particular point or stage of the project what you're contracting to do, what you're supposed to do. So at the start of the project, the project definition may come from your customer with specifications that says these are the things that must be included, must be specified to be done if the project works. Specifications, or the word specifications, is also used to describe what you've produced and characterize what you produced at the end of a project. And these specifications need to be very unambiguous, they need to be measurable, um, they need to be something that you can prove, and they say what your design accomplishes, what you've managed to do. Um, and the way to think about specifications, they're a type of contract between you and your customer, and in school your customer might be your professor, or the grade you're getting, or the, the institution, or whoever's giving you a diploma. When you get out of the working world, it's more like you, you really, really will have a customer, or somebody you're contracting with. And law and contract law is designed to protect the parties in negotiation. They protect both parties. Um, because you really can't tell how honest somebody is until you have a long history of working with them. So specifications are extremely valuable to you as an engineer because if you meet the specifications, it's awfully hard for the customer to come back and say, well, this isn't what I really wanted, so I'm not going to pay you. If you fail to meet the specifications, uh, you know you have not fulfilled your terms of the contract, and you know that even though you're angry about it, uh, seeking a uh, legal solution or, or fighting about it probably won't get you anywhere. So specifications are extremely valuable to you as an engineer. Um, good specifications, there are lots of bad specifications out there. In the chapter in um, the book Design for Electrical and Computer Engineers by Ford and Colston discusses this in quite a bit more detail. But specifications, a good set of specifications should state what you're going to do, not how you're going to do it. They shouldn't limit your solution options, but they should define what a good solution should be. Um, and a lot of people, when they start to think of specifications, think of them as constraining. Uh, we must do this, we must do that. They're laws or rules. Um, and that's a dangerous place to get to, because beyond a list of specifications, you need to develop a mental image of what you're designing. For example, Wiley e. Coyote, and we've seen this in many cartoons, uh, comes up with very detailed blueprints. Um, and sketches and specifications of what his design is going to do. But he doesn't really follow through with this mental image, a vision, a picture, a, a movie in your head of what's going to happen when his specifications are put into motion and designed into the thing he's doing. And we see over and over again the disaster that results um, when you don't have a clear mental image of what it is you're designing and you simply go by a list of specifications that don't have a firm meaning to you, that aren't driven by a mental model. The other three things we're going to talk about, and much more briefly than specification, are constraints, standards, and trade-offs. Um, constraints are your friend. These are external factors that limit what you can do. And the reason constraints are your friend is that novice designers and um, they're novices by definition, they don't recognize the difficulty and time needed to accomplish something. If they did, they would be expert designers. And constraints basically mean you have a smaller parameter space to explore. Um, if you're given a completely open-ended design, it can eat up your time, it can eat up your soul, it can eat up money like nothing else. So constraints really, by limiting the exploration space that you have to go through as a designer, really help you in your design. And you should welcome constraints rather than think they're something that, that are negative. And the, the name constraints even makes it sound something negative, but they're really your friend when you're doing design. Um, standards are simply a, a language term. 
Um, they allow us to communicate very complex constraints in a minimum number of words. Uh, for example, if I gave you a design project that said your device needed to be powered off of a USB port and communicate with a host computer via USB, I can do that in a sentence or two, as I just did. Um, but if you actually get into the specifications and the standards of what USB is in its full technical detail, as you are responsible for as an engineer, and you download this, you find it's a 3.8 meg zip file. There are seven PDF documents in there. And the main document describing USB standards and the USB communication protocol is 482 pages long. And that's just one document. Um, so one needs to be careful and realize that as you develop as an engineer, a lot of your time is going to be spent researching, learning about, and conforming to standards, because that way we don't have to generate giant stacks of documents when we give a project to somebody. We can simply say USB, but that has a lot of stuff attached to it that's not immediately visible. And standards, of course, make sure our work is compatible with that others. If I follow the USB standard, I can hook my device to any computer that has a USB port and be assured that as I follow this standard, it's going to work. And this makes your product, product able to be sold. Uh, trade-offs, this doesn't really need a lot of discussion. Engineering design is all about trade-offs. You can't have everything. You simply can't. Um, and so we're always making trade-offs in cost in terms of how heavy it needs to be, in terms of the number of components, in terms of its performance. And really, as an engineer, if it really comes down to making some hard decisions about trade-offs, this is where you need to go to your project manager, you need to go to your customer and say, look, from a technical point of view, you can have A or you can have B, but you can't have both. Which is more important to you? Uh, can we compromise between them? But it's better to let the person you're designing for make the trade-offs and make those decisions rather than you arbitrarily doing it as an engineer. And with trade-offs, you're never going to be completely happy about your designs. Um, and we simply learn to live with it. It's a part of engineering, and we're very pragmatic about our work in the world as engineers. So that wraps up our discussion on problem identification and on requirement specification. Uh, hopefully this has been a little bit illuminating, and I highly recommend chapters 2 and 3 of Ford and Colston's book designed for electrical and computer engineers to learn more about this and to learn more about specific tools that you can use um, in understanding this a little bit better.